Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Ames Public Library, both in person and at home for this program, which is part of our 2022 lecture series in partnership with Ames Public Library and Ames History Museum. My name is Kathy Cooney. I am an adult services librarian here at APL. And the library's mission is to connect you to the world of ideas, which we do through diverse and inclusive resources and programs like this one tonight. So for those of you with us here in person, this room does have an induction loop for the benefit of hearing aid users. You just need to switch your hearing aid to T and we have a hearing assistance device available back in the back of the room. If you'd like to use that, just come see me. For those of you with us virtually, please submit your questions through the Q&A or chat function, which is at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We will monitor those and make sure that they are shared with our speaker. If you get bumped out of the meeting, follow the original link to get back in. And today's session is being recorded and will be posted to the History Museum's YouTube channel after the event. And you can find a link to that video and a list of related reading sources on the Ames Public Library site, just amespl.org slash history lectures. And we will have time for questions at the end. And we do request, even if you're here in person, that you speak your questions into the microphone so that the folks at home can hear you because all of the sound runs through our microphones. So Alex and I will run around and make sure everyone can speak through one. All right, and with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Casey to introduce our speaker tonight. Hey everyone, I'm Casey Vance. I'm the executive director at Ames History Museum. And I'd like to welcome you here um, in person and online. Um, we're so happy to have this great partnership with the Ames Public Library to present the lecture series every year. Um, I did want to mention our current feature exhibit at the museum, which is Black Trailblazers. It tells the story of nine African-American individuals and their contributions um, from Ames history and beyond. So stop by to see this exhibit if you haven't already. And I did want to mention too that we just recently installed a new exhibit about Visha in celebration of the 100th anniversary of the first Visha, um, which is this May. So, oh. <laughs> Come see the exhibit uh, so you can remember Visha. Um, <laughs> Um, and then I would like to introduce our speaker for tonight. Um, Kathy Speck is a longtime Ames History Museum volunteer, former board member, um, and she is the one who puts together the lecture series each year. So we're really grateful for her volunteer contributions. And um, tonight it's her turn to give the talk. So no, without further ado, here's Kathy. First, I want to test this microphone. Can everybody hear me all right? All right. All right. Very good. Very good. I wanted to say um, uh, there is a little card over on the table here if you want to pick it up to remind you of the rest of the lecture series. This is the second of five lectures that we'll be presenting. So I would first like to acknowledge and thank museum staff member emeritus Dennis Wendell for researching and developing this wonderful program that I'm using tonight with his permission. Uh, when Dennis developed this wonderful script, it was personal for him because his great uncle Bob Robinson was a conductor on the Ames and College Railway and Bob's brother Jim was an engineer fireman. So it really was very uh, meaningful to him. The Dinky was the early rail service between downtown Ames and the college. It had a huge impact on two separate communities, downtown and campus town, and involved several prominent locals, including Captain Wallace Greeley, Parley Sheldon, Professor Joseph Budd and his talented daughter, Etta, and even George Washington Carver. People sometimes ask why the railroad, why the railroad was given the name the Dinky. And it's probably derived from the fact that the engine was quite small in scale. In other words, dinky. <laughs> Another possibility is that the term is a play on the word donkey for donkey engine, a type of small locomotive used to switch rolling stock in a rail yard. Donkey engines were sometimes included free with the purchase of a full-size steam locomotive. What a thought. Let's start our story. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I skipped a slide. Here is uh, the Nike, uh, the, the fancier of the engines uh, that was employed. 
So let's start our story. In 1858, the year Iowa Agricultural College and Model Farm was established, it was located on 838 acres of land, two miles west of the future town of Ames, which was established in 1864. The reason for the separation was to limit distractions for students, such as spiritous liquors and corrupting entertainments. In fact, no alcohol was supposed to be sold within a two mile radius of campus. And so in this picture, you can see the little town of Ames, very small, getting started and way, way, way over here on the horizon, the college, the first few buildings of the college. So from the 1860s until 1890, the access between town and college was either by walking the Chicago and Northwestern tracks or taking the Boone Road, which was later known as Lincoln Way. The track route meant that you walked the tracks until you were parallel to the college, then you cut across a pasture and took a footpath to your destination. Quite a hike first thing in the morning for your early class. Taking the dirt road my option meant coping with ever-changing weather. Look at that mud. In the spring thaw, that dirt, turned, that dirt road turned to thick, sticky mud. The dirt road was negotiated by a horse-drawn uh, omnibus known as the college bus. Operated by Nichols and Maxwell livery, it picked up passengers, baggage, and mail from the depot or the hotel at the east end of Onondaga, and Onondaga, as I hope some of you know, the name was changed to Main Street. Uh, can, you, can you see that little, uh, very crude, little horse-drawn cart? Ames population uh, was about 100 people in 1866, two years after its establishment. And student enrollment was 93 when classes began in 1868. Within 25 years, the population of Ames had increased more than tenfold and the campus population had tripled. With these increases, it became obvious that a more rapid means of travel between the two would be needed. Particularly important was a faster connection between the Chicago and Northwestern Depot downtown and campus. So here's the depot, and it, it used to sit right about where Dutch Oven Bakery sits, just off of, uh, off of Duff. So that was the original location. In September of 1890, a small group of Ames and college backers formed a private corporation to address the need for improved transportation. The original incorporators and directors included influential individuals from Ames, Boone, and Madrid. I'll focus on six of these that were particularly important uh, to Ames. Judge John L. Stevens was president of the corporation. He was born in Northfield, Vermont, and began life farming and working on the railroad. John attended Iowa Agricultural College and graduated in the first class in 1872 with a degree in civil engineering. He later studied law and was admitted to the bar in 1873. In Ames, the family lived in an ever-expanding home at the southeast corner of Ninth and Douglas. This is how the house looked just before being torn down to install a small neighborhood park at the corner of 9th and Douglas. His first official position was city recorder, then city attorney. Later, he became a district attorney, a district judge, and in 1912 was a candidate for Iowa governor, though he was unsuccessful. Parley Sheldon was the first superintendent of the railroad. A Civil War veteran, he moved here in 1875, farming and breeding horses south of Ames. In 1890, he purchased the Story County Bank located at the northeast corner of Douglas and Maine, actually just right down the block from where we are. His bank was directly east of Captain Wallace Greeley's Union National Bank. The two banks eventually merged to become the Union Story Bank, then it was known as Union Story Trust and Savings Bank, then United Bank and Trust, then First Star, and the two banks live on to this day as U.S. Bank. It was said that on a slow banking day, Parley enjoyed driving the dinky himself. 
He was a councilman in 1883 and mayor the following year. He served as mayor four different times for a total of 18 years over a 32 year period. The Sheldon Munn Hotel, built 1815 to 16, was a partnership with lumbermen Hiram and Alfred Munn. Parley was a strong lobbyist for Iowa State College, as well as good roads for Iowa. He was also a prime mover in making Ames the permanent location for the Iowa Highway Commission in 1923, which of course is now the Iowa Department of Transportation. Joseph Budd was corporation's secretary and also a professor of botany at Iowa State College. In 1891, with Judge Stevens, he built a substantial building at the northeast corner of Kellogg and Maine, now the Loft Consignment Store. Over time, the first floor held grocery furniture and hardware stores. The second floor held an opera house with a seating capacity of 600 people. The Budd family lived in the brick mansion at the northeast corner of 8th and Kellogg. It was built in 1888 and is now Youth and Shelter Services Youth Recovery House. This portrait taken around 1882 shows Joseph, his wife, Sarah, son, Alan, and daughter, Etta. <coughs> Etta was an artist of some talent and taught art at Simpson College. She was responsible for recruiting one of her students, George Washington Carver, to attend Iowa State College. Carver arrived on campus in 1891 received his BS degree in 1894 and completed work on his master's degree in 1896. He is possibly the most famous dinky passenger since he rode the train to reach the Bud home where he was hosted on many occasions. Edgar Stanton was an important incorporator. He was a classmate of Judge Stevens and the top scholar in the first graduating class at Iowa State College in 1872. He joined the faculty on graduation and served Iowa State with distinction for 50 years. He filled various academic positions, including head and professor of the Department of Mathematics, dean of the junior college, vice president, and four times was acting president. Stanty, as he was known, was chiefly, chiefly responsible for organizing the Iowa State Alumni Association in 1878. The Carillon in the Campanile on campus was named in honor of his first wife, Margaret. Dr. David Fairchild, another incorporator, came to Ames in 1872 and served as a physician at Iowa Agricultural College from about 1879 to 1894. He was an eminent surgeon in Iowa and practiced in the state for over 50 years. In 1918, he left private practice in Ames to become chief surgeon for the Chicago and Northwestern Railroad at Clinton, Iowa, treating railway workers who suffered injuries from accidents. Dr. Fairchild authored a book, The History of Medicine in Iowa, published in 1927, and it soon became a standard reference work. Finally, finally, we come to Captain Wallace Greeley, who served as superintendent after Parley Sheldon. He was born in New York State and served in the Civil War, achieving the rank of major. In 1866, he married Mary Young, and the couple came to Ames, where he was always referred to as captain by his friends and associates. Like Sheldon, Greeley farmed south of Ames before moving into town and purchasing a home at 11th and Douglas. Later in 1882, he built the home that is today the Adams Funeral Home and where his portrait still stands. Greeley served as mayor from 1889 to 90, was on the school board, and he and Mary contributed the original site for the public library. Greeley was founder and president of the Union National Bank, so named for his loyalty to the Union Army. The Greeleys lost two children in infancy and when Mary died in 1914, Wallace built a hospital in her honor, dedicated September 24th, 1916. The incorporators proposed forming the Ames Street Railway Company, operating under the names of the Ames and College Railway. Their purpose was, quote, to construct a horse car railway between Ames and the college, unquote. But in the final agreement with the city, the text reads, said Ames Street Railway Company hereby agrees to construct and have in operation a standard gauge railway to be operated by steam motor 
or other improved motive power as may be, may be determined. Animal power is hereby expressly prohibited. Said railway is to be completed and in operation on or before November 1st, 1892. Now it's interesting that the progressive railroad members won out and eliminated horsepower and that the contract limited the motor speed to no greater than eight miles per hour. Now that capacity did earn it the rapid transit designation <laughs> that is lettered on the engine, considering that it is faster than the average person's walking speed of three miles per hour or a horse pulling a load at four to five miles per hour. The conductor and driver were admonished to use all proper care to prevent injury to teams, carriages, wagons, and other vehicles. The trustees of Iowa Agricultural College granted the new company right-of-way across the campus in January of 1891. An agreement was also made authorizing the company to pick up the college mail at the Ames Post Office and deliver it to campus. <clears throat> On the 4th of July, 1891, the dinky made its first run between downtown Ames and campus well in advance of the November 1892 target date. Can you imagine any other project being that far in advance? It's amazing. To quote a writer at the time, a person can now make a trip from Ames to the college in a few moments and with just as much comfort on cold, wet days as on warm and sunny ones. Now you would think that the paper would have reported such a big story, but there was only a rather oblique reference. Quote, President Beardshire wants a close friendship between the college and the town. He wants the town people to come out numerously to college exercises now that the motor line is running and college is very easy accessible, unquote. Two months later, a review of an Iowa State band concert, the newspaper noted, the college people furnished their quota of patrons and the motor line did its duty and the citizens of Ames, old and young, turned out in large numbers. Now from this and other instances, we learn that, that the train was indeed meeting expectations for rapid transit and was referred to as the motor line. Most commonly though, it was simply called the motor. But eventually the public adopted the nickname that had been given to it by students, the Dinky. The original cost of the road and equipment came to $27,000. Even at a modest fare of five cents throughout the Dinky's career, receipts per day reached a high of $700. Now I need a little math, that's 14,000 nickel fares. The venture did pay for itself, although one year the railway, railway was sued and financial backers were nearly ruined when the dicky ran over a young boy and severed his leg. Oh. That was the only accident. I want to talk about the rolling stock. So we'll start with the engine at the head of the train. The engine was essentially a small scaled steam locomotive with cab fully extended to camouflage the boiler. This unusually sharp photo clearly shows the key components. The text, on, the text on the builder's plate is Baldwin Locomotive Works, Philadelphia. Baldwin was the premier locomotive works in the United States. There were at least two different engines or possibly three, depending if one was a later rebuild. The engines shared several features. Each had cow catchers, and each bore the numeral one or two and rapid transit lettered on the sides. They may be distinguished by their contrasting roof lines and side panels. The more Victorian and elaborate of the engines had a flattened roof with a clear story and rapid transit lettered uh, with a flourished panel on each side. The planar locomotive had a curved roof and more mundane side panels. And also actually it just looked a lot more dinged up. One of the engines supposedly came to Ames as a recycled one from Waterloo. The Ames and College steam engines were small 040 locomotives, meaning no leading wheels, four drive wheels and no trailing wheels. And they ran on standard, not narrow gauge track. Now you contrast this with a full full-size 440 steam train, 
A coal tender never appeared in any known photos of the engines, which were likely refueled at the coal bin <clears throat> at the eastern end of the line. Three passenger cars were purchased used from the city of Des Moines. During the busiest times of the day, all three cars were put into use. In this photo, two locomotives are shown pulling the three passenger cars. Each car had a stove that was fired in the winter by the conductor. A very useful flat car was also included in the inventory of rolling stock. Now it is interesting to note the small scale of the dinky rails. 30 pounds versus today's 136 pound track based on the weight per yard of rail. And I want to emphasize again that the dinky was not a narrow gauge train. It ran on standard rail. And uh, the reason for that, I'll explain just a bit later. The rolling stock was housed downtown in a car and engine house at the east end of Maine, just east of Duff Avenue and a stone's throw from the original 1865 Chicago and Northwestern Depot. Now this map shows the placement. The, the red circle is the uh, engine house. And you can see um, Duff Avenue is here. And so you can, I, hopefully you can kind of orient yourself to the east end of uh, Main Street. The Munn Lumberyard was established in 1891. In this view, we see a corner of the lumberyard and the dinky coal shed. And here's the dinky getting loaded up and ready to go, but take a look at the load of trunks on the wagon waiting to be loaded onto the train or coming off the train. Every hour, the dinky made its 20 minute route, starting at 7 a.m. and ending at 10 p.m., at least in 1905. Three blasts from the engine's whistle announced that departure was in five minutes. Two quick toots meant the engine was pulling out. Starting on its two mile route, the train crossed from its barn on Main Street to Story Street that we now call Fifth. And I wanna emphasize again that the dinky route used Fifth Street whereas the later electric streetcar route used Main Street. Traveling west, the train picked up passengers along the way. The conductor would announce each intersection. Oops. I'm sorry, I should have talked about these maps. Let me just go back a little bit. This is really, um, this uh, plat map is really an excellent um, view of the, the root of the dinky. It started here, and you can see this uh, uh, dotted line, which is the root of the uh, dinky railroad. And so this was Main Street here, and you can clearly see that the dinky followed Fifth Street. And then all of this track, of course, is the main line for the Chicago and Northwestern. <coughs> <clears throat> Traveling west, the train picked up passengers along the way. The conductor would announce each intersection. Now here we see Douglas, where the tracks are just barely visible. You can just kind of see these little ruts right here, going through a dirt road. After Kellogg, in the middle of the block, the, tra the tracks pass in front of the old armory that later housed O'Neill Dairy. And you can clearly see the tracks here in this picture. Next came Burnett Avenue, Clark Avenue, and then Hoggett Avenue. Now at the sound of this funny name, Hoggett, the students on board would laugh and call out, no, it's Pig Alley. <laughs> Even eventually this irritated the conductor and local residents so much that they petitioned the city and the street name was changed to Grand Avenue. <laughs> Mr. Hoggett was an early pioneer and long gone before they took his name off the street. 
At the west end of Main Street, where the dinky crossed the Chicago and Northwestern lines, the tracks were laid so that mainline freight cars could be switched onto the dinky rails and pushed out to campus, which was a very ingenious and very advantageous situation for a whole lot of reasons. So the oops. so the um, dinky line came out here, crossed the Chicago and Northwestern tracks, and then kind of paralleled for a while the Chicago and Northwestern route out toward campus. Let me find my place here. Then the line crossed over the Squaw Creek, now Iowa Creek Bridge and the floodplain, which in spring was often flooded. Look at that raised um, uh, rail bed. And way up here on the horizon, what do you see? That's the uh, Marston Water Tower. And I get you oriented there. The first stop on campus was the platform at the rear of the farmhouse. An early resident of this historic home was Tama Jim Wilson, the first ag experiment station director and the first dean of agriculture at Iowa State. On bitterly cold days, he was known to have invited shivering students into the house while they waited for the motor. From there, the dinky poured on the coal to surmount the grade in front of the old Ag Hall, which was later renamed Botany Hall and is now Cat Hall. Next, it passed the women's dormitory, Margaret Hall. Here we see the dinky in front of Morrill Hall. Look how close it is to that building. And then the route finished at the Western Terminus. There was no turnaround at this end. The engine simply went into reverse and pushed instead of pulled for the return trip. And this uh, picture was taken from the Marston Water Tower and it is a wonderful way to see the layout of the early buildings on campus. And again, here is a map kind of showing how the uh, um, Dinky's rail line came in behind the farmhouse, across campus, and then ended up uh, in between what was Old Main and Morrill Hall. And you can see no turnaround, just put it in reverse. And this is uh, much the same, uh, where you can see the, the route. In 1892, a year after the launch, a terminal known as the Motor Depot or the Dinky Station was built between Old Main and Morrill Hall. It also served as a post office and a social center. As a writer in the 1898 bomb said about the Motor Depot, here it is that, new students, that, that the new student gets his first impression of college life. Here he usually meets his first college acquaintances some of whom may be his lifelong friends. Here it is that he comes day after day, perhaps for his mail, perhaps perchance to greet some friend. And here he parts from his classmates at the end of each term. And here he finds his companion on his return, delighted to see him back again. At the close of his college course, he bids his friends farewell. And it may be here that he bids goodbye to his college sweetheart. Mm -hmm. Romantic thing there. <laughs> After the dinky era, the station was moved further north, closer to Morrill Hall. It continued as in use as a postal substation with a bookstore added. In 1920, an addition was built onto the north side for increased space. And about this time, a group of young men called the Sunshine Club was formed. On sunny days, they would assemble on the front steps to engage in discussion and uh, a little bit of girl watching. <laughs> and here it is, a little later, beat Iowa. In 1940, in 1946, another building was moved in and attached to the west side. And in 1953, the east wing was added. 
Also in 1953, the bookstore was relocated to the Memorial Union, and 10 years later, the post office moved out. Automated snack service was begun in 1959, and the building officially became known as the Hub. A copy center, ticket office, and university traffic office were moved in over the next 20 years. By, 18, by 1983, the traffic and ticket offices were relocated and the outdoor seating area to the east was built. It is now devoted entirely to food service. Throughout the hub's many renovations, campus architects have tried to maintain the look of a small railroad station strictly for nostalgic reasons. The uh, Ames and College Railway placed ads and time schedules in local newspapers such as the Ames Intelligencer, the precursor to the Tribune, and the Iowa State Student, later known as the Iowa State Daily, and other student publications such as the yearbook, The Bomb. This ad placed in the 1905, this ad was placed in the 1905 bomb. Although rather stilted in tone, it nonetheless illustrates the importance of the student customers to whom it may concern. This is to certify that we realize our dependence upon students for much of our patronage, et cetera, et cetera. By contrast, this ad, obviously a spoof, was written by Arch Crawford while a student at Iowa State and appeared in the 1906 bomb. Archibald was the son of Ames school teacher, Louise Crawford, for whom the Fourth Ward Schoolhouse was named. Watch our smoke, it says. Nothing is too poor for our customers. Your education is only half completed unless you patronize the Ames and College Railway. Mm -hmm. This great East and West thoroughfare is an education in itself. Magnificent palatial trains run hourly over the finest roadbed in the world. A trip on the ANC is a picturesque reality. You can smell real smoke and breathe live cinders into your lungs. <laughs> Our system of coach lighting produces more solid smoke than any other system ever invented. <laughs> and there is no extra charge if you have to stand up or hang on to the rear end. It is a distinct pleasure to ride over this great trunk line where business blocks, city parks, rail yards, forest rivers, fields, and pastures blend into a harmonious whole on account of our smoke. <laughs> See that your ticket reads via the A and C. Poking a little fun. Probably a little undercurrent of truth, actually. A writer in an early bomb also alluded to the cinders. One expert excerpt reads, well, here is one day gone to smash. Got a cinder in one eye and a hunk of coal in the other coming out to the college on the old dinky. Gosh, I think I'll walk hereafter. <laughs> Students, faculty, school children, and townspeople were the bread and butter of the dinky's passenger operation. With only three passenger cars, overflow riders often, <laughs> often had to cling to the platform and steps. The dinky allowed faculty and students to live downtown and easily commute to campus. Look at those packed railroad cards. <clears throat> One of the most challenging jobs for the dinky involved carrying visitors to the college during excursion day. This early public relations effort to showcase the college was the brainchild of President Beardshire and eventually evolved into the spring celebration Visha. People from around the state converged on Ames and rode the dinky to campus. They toured the buildings, watched a parade in athletic events, and entered contests. Records show that as many as 15,000 visitors came one year. The flat car, normally reserved for hauling freight, was even pressed into service to carry passengers whose legs dangled over the sides as they rode. I'm sure OSHA would be horrified today. <laughs> and we wonder why OSHA was established. Many visitors simply walked the tracks to campus or hitched a ride on a farmer's wagon. Besides carrying passengers, the dinky carried mail from the downtown post office to the campus terminal where letters were sorted into pigeonholes for pickup. A major contribution during the dinky's reign um, 
was the transporting of a considerable quantity of building materials and equipment during the building boom on campus. New construction during the Dinkies era included the Campanile, built in 1897 to 98, Marston Hall, built in 1903, Alumni Hall, built 18, 1904 to 07, East Hall was put up in 1905, and Beardshire Hall, 1906. There's the Campanile. Uh, construction materials visible, but not uh, no clock or bells quite yet. And um, here are the tracks that they installed for construction of Beardshire Hall, which was originally called the central building. So you can see this little, uh, this little spur that came off of the end of the line to transport construction materials there. In this view of the northwest corner of Beardshire, we can see the tracks running quite close to the building. Even after, I, this is an amazing picture to me, um, a, a clear demonstration of the role that the dinky played. <clears throat> Even after the end of its passenger career, the dinky continued as a donkey engine on construction sites. The electric trolley that succeeded the dinky probably also carried materials for new buildings. As uh, the mechanical engineering build, uh, building went up in 1908, Curtis Hall in 1909, the engineering annex in 1910, McKay Hall West in 1911, and the veterinary quadrangle in 1912. A less serious contribution was the transport by flat car of empty boxes, crates, and scrap wood to the athletic field. A victory bonfire was a tradition when an important home game was won. Now, speaking of those pesky college students, the dinky was also subject to numerous pranks. Scathing complaints were common about irregular service, smoke and soot pollution, danger of fires from sparks, and the rundown condition of the rolling stock. As if these weren't enough to denigrate the students or the service, student pranks were perpetuated with each new class of freshmen. Greasing the rails on an incline was the most common stunt. The slope at Ag Hall, now Cat Hall, was the steepest and students delighted to see the wheels spin to a stop and the engineer's face turn red with anger. Several dinky anecdotes are related by Gladys Meads in her local history book, At the Squaw and the Skunk. One category was problematic kids known as faculty brats. <laughs> Seaman Knapp, son of Register, Registrar Herman Knapp, was a royal pain. His scheme was to ride the, uh, in the ultimate forbidden spot on the dinky engine, the open space between the water tanks, plaguing engineer Frank Lang. Seaman delighted in sneaking on board when passenger traffic was heavy and Frank was distracted. The engineer diverted valuable time playing a game of wits with the boy shooing him out of various hiding places until the train was in motion. By the turn of the century in Iowa, steam passenger rail services were converting to the electric interurban and the Ames and College Railway was no exception. In the early spring of 1906, the Ames and College Railway was sold to the Newton and Northwestern Railway Company at a profit of $2 for every one invested. The following year, the line was sold to the Fort Dodge Des Moines and Southern Railroad, and they extended their interurban line from Kelly to Ames. Power was generated from the dam at Fraser, as well as the power plant at the east end of Main Street. The Nicky tracks on Fifth Street were torn up and steam power vanished for good. New tracks were laid for the electric line running from Main Street to campus. The first interurban car into Ames was on June 29th, 1907. I am especially fond of the picture in the upper left with the bustling Main Street and people all dressed up to be downtown. And there smack in the middle, the electric trolley. The first interurban car into Ames was June 29th, 1907. The interurban made its first run down Ames Main Street in July. Here is the trolley crossing the creek. The interurban gave passengers the opportunity to go north to Fort Dodge or south to Des Moines, 
providing better mass transit than we have today. With the increase in automobile ownership and competition from bus service, even the interurban finally ceased operating in 1929 to be replaced by buses of the interstate transit lines. The passing of the dinky did not go unobserved by the print media. This touching farewell was published in the 1908 bomb. The first line says, farewell thou, oh, much maligned, but most faithful servant upon whom we have heaped the spleen of our ill temper and on and on. You may be wondering whatever became of the dinky engines. The short answer is that they were scrapped. We know this from a report by Seaman Knapp and engineer Frank Lang. This pair made an unsuccessful attempt to locate and reclaim the dinky as a museum piece. The Fort Dodge and Des Moines and Southern Company had previously retired the dinky, the dinky to its Boone Yards. When Knapp and Lang inquired about it, they were told it had just been donated to the scrap iron drive. In other words, it was melted down and cast into cannons and ammunition during World War I. Back in Ames, they spread the word that the dinky had been thrown at the Germans. Probably a fair description. So precious few genuine dinky artifacts, dinky related artifacts still exist today. This little piece of the dinky rail is in our collections and these tickets for the Ames and College Railway are in university archives. The cinder path running parallel to the former dinky tracks is another survivor of the dinky era. It has since been asphalted and is an important pathway between town and campus. The hub has been rebuilt so many times that hardly an original rafter remains, though it does retain the look of a little train station. Even without the, the physical artifacts, the dinky has provided its own legacy. If one were to if one were asked to summarize the Dinky's legacy, one could say that it illustrated a very early instance of town and gown cooperation, fulfill its mission of providing fast and dependable transportation between downtown and campus, made it possible for faculty to live downtown and commute to the college. Early on before this, faculty had to live on campus. The dinky carried school children from the fourth ward to downtown, um, to uh, the downtown school. It, the dinky facilitated the transport of construction materials to campus during a period of great growth. It greatly enhanced public appreciation and visibility of the college, and it boosted the uh, economy of the town. The dinky was in, integral to town and campus life for 16 years and bonded the two communities, a good relationship that continues to this day. The Dinky's legacy has also been commemorated by artwork, publications, merchandise, and even a beverage. When Old Main Brewing Company was in business on Main Street, they featured a wheat-based beer called, you guessed it, Dinky Wheat. According to the menu, flavoring was derived from coriander, chamomile, orange peel, and a, quote, closely guarded fourth secret ingredient, unquote. Could it possibly have been carbonated smoke and, <laughs> and ground cinders? Unfortunately, dinky wheat is no longer available. Now, this familiar uh, image of the dinky appears as part of the historic piers at street corners on 5th Street in downtown Ames. A much less obvious uh, dinky image can be found in the stained glass windows of Gold Star Hall at the Iowa State Memorial Union. In a large photo of the dinky may be seen displayed among other historic photos on Ames Public Library's second floor. The images are from the Farwell T. Brown Photographic Archive, which is an amazing resource of early Ames pictures open to anyone on the library's website. And there is a whole corridor of these wonderful photographs. So the next time we're up on the second floor, pause and take a look. A popular publication by Farwell Brown is his book, A Ride Through Town on the Dinky, 
which the museum does have in his shop. And I noticed it over here on the side table as uh, a, a book you can check out from the library's collection. The muse museum's website also incorporates a number of photos about the dinky accompanied by text. And some of you may have seen this G scale model railroad that was installed outdoors at Ryman Gardens a number of years ago. More recently, another model of the dinky travels the miniature rails indoors at Christmas time in Ryman Gardens Conservatory, part of their magical miniature RG Express. The hardest legacy to verify is the story that the Dinky's rails were used as reinforcing in the construction of the Olson building, better known today as the home of the Spice Restaurant. This forward-looking building was constructed 1911 to 12 and was the very first poured concrete structure in town. An ISU urban planning class once undertook a semester-long study on whether it would be possible to actually revive the Dinky. They did a very thorough job doing research, but at the end concluded it could not be done now with the scarcity of available land, but it really was nice to dream. The museum's own plans for a dinky revival involves building a replica engine at three quarter scale for the permanent exhibit hall in the museum expansion now in development stages. The engine can be entered and will be filled with information on the dinky along with artifacts. It will be ADA accessible so anyone can go inside and get their photo taken riding the dinky. Funds are currently being raised for this expansion project and two local donors have already pledged their contribution to support the dinky replica and we are so excited about that. If anyone sitting in today would like to learn more about the museum expansion, please let us know. And thank you for taking a ride with me on the dinky tonight. Now, if there are questions, we're, we're going to run around and try to get a microphone uh, in front of you. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah, go ahead. Whoop. Wait, wait for the microphone. Also, I wanted, uh, Dennis, would you stand up? Dennis in the back. This is Dennis Wendell. And I, I blame him entirely for this wonderful script and this wonderful story he put down in such great detail. Thanks again, Dennis. It was really wonderful. On one of the slides, I saw that Ames beat Iowa. <laughs> now, when was a, uni or a college called Ames by a lot of people? It, it, well, it, it was early on, it, it was called Ames. It, yeah, it never had college after no initially. No, or, or Iowa, Iowa State Agricultural College or all of the variations. <laughs> but um, that was very common that, that the, uh, the athletic teams were referred, and they even had an A on their sweaters. Oh, okay. Than an I. And what about the beanie caps they wore? Did it have an A on it, or did it have Ames on it? Ames on uh, that I cannot answer. Is anybody no. here that can answer that question? I know through Tom Kershell's research that I think he talked about 1929. They they switched from being putting Ames on their jerseys to putting Iowa State on their jerseys. I think it was 1928 or 29. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Any other questions? Or comments? I um, I had to ask Alex, and he had he had the answer to this question early on. I mentioned that uh, George Washington Carver was probably one of the most famous passengers on the dinky, and I asked Alex where where did uh, Carver live on campus? And you want to? Uh, yeah, he lived in North Hall, the servants' quarters of North Hall. He was able to get a room to to stay in on campus because he wasn't allowed to live in Old Main with the rest of the students. And that was on the back end of Margaret Hall, today kind of the site of uh, LeBaron Hall near McKay. And so just a stone's throw from the dinky line right there. That's right. You could just hop right on. <laughs> hop right on. I have a question from online. Okay. Um, is the uh, cinder walking path still accessible and where can someone access that? The cinder path, absolutely. Well, it's, it's not cinders anymore. It's been uh, beautifully um, uh, asphalted and is a nice smooth surface. 
And um, it is an extension of the bike path that um, goes past Brookside Park, crosses University Boulevard, and it just continues right on. So it's, it's really quite easy to find because it is part of the city's uh, bike path system. And it goes directly south of the uh, Cyride bus barns. I don't know, Kathy didn't mention this in your program, but I know a lot of people call that area Sycamore Row. Have you ever heard that oh, name before, true, too? True, true. And I believe those trees were planted as a windbreak for the dinky. For the, yes. That are there. Yes, yeah. yes. So you can look for the sycamores. You can't miss it. Oh, that beautiful row of sycamores. And they are still the original sycamores that were planted. So they are wonderful old trees. You got a question right now? Yeah. What did they use after the dinky then uh, to get back and forth from downtown to the college? Well, it, it was that electric trolley that I, I showed you the pictures of. And that transition, hmm? How long did that, that went from 1907 to 1929. 1929. Um, and it, it really did, the transition was pretty quick. Um, the, the trolley seemed to be in operation within six months of the selling of the dinky to the Fort Dodge Des Moines and Southern Railroad. And it was a very efficient um, uh, form of transportation because not only did it go back and forth between downtown and campus, you could continue on north to Fort Dodge or south to Des Moines. And I remember hearing stories about how ladies would, would get on the trolley in the morning go shopping at Yonkers, have lunch at the tea room, and then come home all on the same day using the, the trolley. Where did the Zumwalt station fit into all this? The question was, when did Zumwalt station fit into all this? That was part of the electric trolley line. So that would have been the first stop outside of Ames, I believe. Hi, Kathy. Oh, hi. <laughs> Class of 50, 66. <laughs> <laughs> We're still here. Hola, I know we are. <laughs> uh, I remember walking across the Sixth Street, uh, the original Sixth Street uh, Auto Bridge. Yeah. Looking south, you could see the mm -hmm. what, what's now Union Pacific. Mm -hmm. Same uh, bridge, and then the Dinky Bridge. But there was also another bridge that was just black steel that they finally tore down maybe 20 or 30 years ago. Was that, was that part of the structure of the Dinky Bridge that was wood? Or is that another bridge that I think it took uh, coal to the mm. power plant mm. and it was a separate line. So there were two tracks, Dinky track and this coal track. Not sure, does anybody remember that? I'm not that old. <laughs> I thought, Maybe I am. Um, but I remember okay, specifically there's the six, there, seeing there's the, the Sixth Street Auto Bridge, and then immediately south, then the Chicago Northwestern right. uh, Main Line, and then immediately south of that was the Dinky Bridge. Right. And then it was converted to the Trolley Bridge. And maybe and, that. And then it was abandoned, and uh, it was eventually torn down. It, if I remember correctly, though the. Um, it wasn't abandoned. That is how the university power plant got oh, their oh, coal got their in. Coal. Oh, okay. And I think the bridge was actually upgraded to okay. become a steel bridge and eventually was torn down. But the tracks to the power plant followed what is now, what was the cinder path okay. and is now the okay. um, asphalt path. Okay. So I wasn't hallucinating. I, I don't think you were I remember <laughs> seeing hallucinating. That. And that, that, that did remain a very important uh, avenue for the delivery of coal and, and other things. Um, as a matter of fact, I think it was the spur that was used to move the uranium during the Manhattan Project. So that was an important spur line. You're absolutely right. And not hallucinating. You're right. Yeah. Uh, I believe the Fort Dodge Point Southern continued through about the mid 60s um, to a station that's where the Greater Iowa Credit Union is now. Right, right. So uh, um, uh, what, what were you thinking ended in 29? The, the spur that went, uh, I think, from Ames to Kelly. The, the in-town service. The in-town. Uh, the in -town. downtown college stopped in the late 20s. But they were, you could still do the full Dr. Moyne line out of town until the late 
Yeah, the, I thought yeah, that the, there the, were some 50s and 60s campus maps that show it going down Osborne and basically through what's the design college and down um, hmm. uh, hmm. Hayward, hmm. or not Hayward, um, Highland. 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 And um, then it would um, go down that for a bit and um, continue on south through to Kelly. So I'm not sure all the years, but I, I thought that continued to the 50s or 60s. Well, it, and, and, and there was the depot that was on the west side of Grand, just a little bit north of Lincoln Way, was the yeah, the, the great freight, Iranian, the freight Iranian, and that was torn down sixty-five. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I'm not enough of a of a railroad expert to to verify what you're saying, but I have a feeling what you're saying is correct. I think I think the tracks were still there, but I think the passenger service ended in twenty nine. Yeah. Uh, and what killed the passenger service primarily was that uh, the Chicago Northwestern cut off access to downtown. They uh, they stopped giving the uh, interurban any access across the mm -hmm. Chicago Northwestern tracks because they had always seen the dinky as a, a feeder to their service. But when it became the um, Fort Dodge Des Moines and Southern, uh, it was a competitor because it was running parallel to them down to Des Moines. And so, uh, and there was one major accident in the crossover and they just took away permission. Well, first they just gave them no priority. So sometimes it would take an hour to get across, which totally screwed up the, uh, and if you read the uh, student newspapers, they complain all the time about the lack of uh, schedule adherence, but they couldn't get across the Chicago Northwestern to get to downtown. That's when they built a new uh, depot just north of BOT, and totally it became only from that point out to the campus, uh, which still worked for uh, bringing Fourth Ward students to downtown uh, to Central School in the high school, but it it no longer served the main part of Ames. That's Peter Halleck, and he's done an awful lot of research on a lot of different subjects. Thanks, Peter. I appreciate that. That kind of ties into the next question from online. Um, how and where did the dinky cross the Chicago Northwestern line? Let me see if I can get back to that. There, there is the picture. And um, so the dinky line came out here and this, this was the junction point here. And the dinky continued here and the Chicago Northwestern continued there. And then sometimes if the main line had a, uh, some freight that needed to move moved out to campus, then it was diverted to the dinky rail and went on out to campus. Where about did that process begin? Um, Where is it? Go. Yep. <laughs> Tethered. Yeah. Yeah, it really yeah. is. Okay, this this says Hoggett Street, but this is Grand. So it's just a little bit west of Grand. So if Hodge Avenue went straight through. Right behind Wheatsfield. Right behind, yeah. Thanks. Right behind Wheatsfield. Um, way off the map. Way, way out here. So here's uh, on it. It says Onondaga, but this is Main Street. It says Story Street, but it's Fifth. So it kind of went over this way. <coughs> is that clear? Is that clear? Enough? Anything else? You folks have been a great audience tonight, and I thank you sincerely for coming, and I hope we'll see you next month.
Uh, actually, only on Zoom. Oh, wait. Yeah, May. The May lecture is only on Zoom behind the beat from the African American Museum in Cedar Rapids, African American Museum of Iowa in Cedar Rapids. There's going to be a wonderful story about um, the background of the music that we hear today. So I hope you'll join us via Zoom. But thank you for coming tonight. <laughs> <laughs>